Hi, this is Ms. Schmunk, and welcome to part three of this Harry Focus discussion. And by the way, it's Harry's birthday, his 36th birthday. Happy birthday, Harry. As a recap, we had part one, which was Harry, born a prince, which showcased the young life of Harry growing up in a privileged world where love and betrayal, tradition and rebellion were always present within his household. Part two, Harry finding his own path. We see a heartbroken Harry who dealt with his mother's untimely death in the public's eye and bottled his grief for eight years before taking the bold step to find his peace. And now we are at part three, Harry breaking barriers for love. In this final episode of Harry, not final in the podcast, we know from all that we've heard and seen of Harry, that breaking barriers of any kind is sort of his thing. His military service in Afghanistan, his bold step to get mental help, his passion projects that he brought to fruition, and finding his ultimate soulmate, life partner, wife, best friend. How did Harry get that inner resolve? And we've been talking about this in all of the episodes because I think it's important to see how Harry has evolved. And I feel that it's part of his soul, it's part of his DNA, it's part of his psyche. But it's also shaped by those harsh life lessons that he has witnessed and experienced firsthand. He's a man who has removed the filter from his eyes to see all of the world, hear all of its voices, speak his intentions, and go about putting action to his words. He's not perfect, and my job here isn't to make him into a god or a demigod. I'm not here to shellac a jackass into an icon like I would have to do if it was any of the other royal males. This is why I wanted to lay bare who he was, who he is, and get a glimpse of what he is on his way to becoming. There is an inner strength that he will have to tap into repeatedly for the path that he has carved out. He's the cowboy, the samurai, the knight, the hero supposedly chosen to take on the quest and defeat evil for the greater good. It's a Hollywood movie for 100 years later so that they can romanticize and make it even more grandiose as we do with our myths and folk tales of that cowboy that samurai, or the knight. Rejoice in that we're lucky enough to see this play out in real time. We are part of this history, and our support of Harry and Meghan doesn't make us spectators, but active participants of their story. Because we can call foul on the lies and the manipulated news. We can call foul on the machinations of the firm. We can call foul against troll campaigns designed to harass and intimidate them and us. Harry and Meghan have their global Avengers that are unafraid and willing to stare down the beasts. We will not let them play revisionist history because they have tried and are brazen in their attempts. Here are some criticisms I want to share. Had an extra quality that frustrated critics. Let the journalists and the paparazzi in and now complain taking on too many public duties, behavior damaging the monarchy, self-indulgent, distasteful and inappropriate, demeaned the royal office, acts of charity re results in a negative reaction in the media, looked down on the family and lost social privilege by doing the interview. Now, I bet you think I'm talking about Harry, right? Nope. This was his mother, Diana. How similar is the language when talking about Harry and or Meghan? It's the same thing, just a different time. In this final episode, I'm bringing up Diana a lot because the treatment of the outlier is the same as it was 20 odd years ago. There is a frenzied attempt to protect the monarchy 
by the foulest means possible. As if this is the only way to protect the monarchy or that it needs this sort of bloodletting to keep it safe. But Harry is not clueless. He knows this. Harry lived it. So when he recalls the trauma of how so many destroyed his mother's reputation, life, and even her legacy, how dare anyone say that he has no right to do so? That they are tired of hearing about the pain of his loss? How dare the audacity to tell him to get over it when they are the ones who let their forked tongues work in overdrive to be punitive? Because just like the British media would rather not have Diana's legacy overshadow traditional royal values, they don't want Harry to overshadow his father or brother's time under the spotlight. After Diana's death, Prime Minister Tony Blair characterized Diana as a manipulative person capable of playing on other people's feelings and emotions. By the way, it was at his insistence that William and Harry walked behind their mother's coffin in his effort and, as he felt, his duty to protect the monarchy from itself because of their silence after Diana's death. So it's not about the children as people, but tools to be used as props on a real life stage. And I'm sure in his head, he had saved the monarchy and now he can pat himself on the back and William and Harry, well, they'll just get over it. By the way, Earl Spencer, who's Betty's godson, and Diana's brother, also recently reflected on the day of the funeral, saying that he was led to believe the princess had wanted to join the procession, but now claims he was lied to, saying it was a bizarre and cruel thing for them to do. No clarification as to who the them was. But I want to read his pledge that he said at the eulogy in addressing William and Harry. He says, I quote, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which Diana was steering these young men, that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. We fully respect the heritage in which they have been born, but we, like you, recognize the need for them to experience as many different aspects of life as possible. Unquote. So, tell me, how many times did Uncle Charles Spencer speak up publicly to defend Harry? To reiterate his need to experience different aspects of life. To do all that he can. According to some sources, the same brother denied Diana's request to move back home because of the paparazzi. Media was quick to praise this eulogy, but I'm going to insert my eye roll right here because talk is cheap. Another example of how hard the media will try to erase relevance was when I reviewed one particular person. In her bio, she's author, historian, journalist, and Applebaum, who, in her write-up in 2007, about the 10th anniversary, paid particular attention to the statistics that because one million people showed up for Diana's funeral, that's only about 2,002% of the British population. And so it meant that 98% were indifferent. She even highlighted another news headline that said, Diana, just another dead glamorous celebrity that compared the 10th anniversary annual rituals at Elvis Presley's Graceland and called the late princess the patron saint of the completely self-obsessed. So this Apple bomb, bomb, whatever the heck her name is, character, she believed that the public's right has a right to cast skepticism that Diana's death somehow changed the country forever. As she says, the genuinely bizarre aspect of the all-consuming Diana mania that gripped Britain a decade ago this week is how slight a trace it has left behind. Actually, the royal family is pretty much the same, only quieter. 
From Diana, they learned that there is such a thing as too much publicity. Prince Charles and his children are more rarely seen in public. The prince's con current consort, Camilla Park Bowles, is admired for holding her tongue. Again, I'm highlighting the depth to denounce Diana's relevance blatantly in Harry's face. Another twit, Rosemary Roberts, in her write-up in 2007, titled, It's Time to Give Diana Mania a Rest, mentions Applebaum's sentiments. So one jackass loves another jackass. Among the best was, this is part of Rosemary's write-up, among the best was Ann Applebaum, the Washington Post columnist who reminisced about living in London at the time of Diana's death. Applebaum said the sobbing reaction was not only un-British, but insane. Millions of Americans got choked up and went batty too. Okay, so what the heck is un-British? But we can unpack that at another time, because I sense the origin of the BS would reveal a lot of its writer's thoughts about certain things about race. She, Rosemary Roberts, continues, but maybe after 10 years, time's up. Last week's memorial service in London, the one where Prince Harry emotionally called her the best mother in the world, will probably be the last. With these boneheaded predictions, these women are good for a carnival booth for fortune-telling grifts. Applebaum on her blog says, History repeated itself as farce this month when Prince Harry's third in line to the British tr throne appeared at a costume party in Nazi uniform. The full wrath of the media and of everyone else came down on his boyish head. Prince Harry, one of the British royal family's dimmer bulbs. I only read that part for the insult and to show how he was underestimated from the start. So those were comments at the 10-year anniversary. So let's jump forward to the 20-year commentary and see the difference. One article praised Diana's humanitarian efforts around the globe or that it can be seen by many as her most enduring legacy. Harry says, one of the things our mother taught William and I was the value of doing good when no one is watching. She visited hospitals late at night to comfort patients. She spent hours writing letters to privately support the work of others. She achieved a lot by shining a spotlight, but she worked just as hard when the cameras were gone. Now, all I want to do, this is Harry still talking, is try and fill the holes that my mother has left. And that's what it's about for us, is trying to make a difference, and in making a difference, making her proud. So his uncle most recently said, one of the reasons I want to talk now is because I think that after 20 years, someone shifts from becoming a contemporary person to one of history, and Diana deserves a place in history. Ken Wharf, who served as Diana's protection officer from 1986 to 1993, said Diana was everything the public imagined her to be. What I liked, his quote, what I liked about her was that there was always, there was only one side. What you saw in public was actually how she behaved in private. And I think you know what the public got was the real Diana. This wasn't, you know, a person that dressed up for the occasion and spoke for that occasion. For the anniversary this year, William and Harry released a joint statement. The statue of Diana will be installed in the sunken garden of Kensington Palace on July 1st, 2021, marking the princess's 60th birthday. Both William and Harry hoped that this are hoping that the statue will help all those who visit Kensington Palace to reflect on their mother's life and her legacy. What a way to immortalize the symbol of their mother against the harsh haters who would rather she disappeared in the dusty bookshelves of British history. 
and that longed-for stiff upper lip can be restored for a romantic, nostalgic Britain where people knew their class, knew their place, and you folded and conformed to tradition. And this wouldn't have happened without Harry and his brother's commitment to honoring their mother and her legacy. They're not allowing the media, the empty brain journalists, the royal handlers to shape the narrative. And Harry has continued to defy those who are so ready to count him out, who underestimate his intelligence and dismiss his potential to be a global ambassador for charities and now for his own foundation. Their little brains are just exploding in sequential fashion as Harry, who had already taken bold steps with his military endeavors and his passion projects, did so once again in 2016 with his new girlfriend, Meghan Markle. When a mutual friend got Harry and Meghan together on a blind date, I'm sure he had no idea the depth of what was to come. Yes, he saw previous girlfriends suffer under the press's scrutiny, but immediately he saw how much lower the media were willing to scrape in their biased coverage of Meghan. Because this was a huge deal. A biracial woman divorced whose mother is African-American joining the House of Windsor. They were smitten with each other, like real love makes happen. And after two dates, they went on holiday to Botswana. Now, I don't know about you, but in college, after two dates with my boyfriend, he took me to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Okay, so I married him, and we hit 30 years together this year. But, you know, let's weigh Botswana versus KFC. But I guess love is love. So their love wasn't brokered. Yes, a friend put them together, but I'm talking about the almost strategic analysis that was done to find the right woman for Charles by the courtiers and the queen. Of course, Harry is not an immediate king in the making, but as we heard in the news, William supposedly had his say on whether Meghan was marriage material. And you know what? I get that. I gave my opinion on my brother's girlfriends, especially after his divorce. I was protective and willing to be the bouncer. And I wasn't always positive. So I'm not put out by Williams pulling up his brother. However, 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 Harry brought Meghan fully into the royal life where she obviously impressed Betty or that wouldn't have happened. So this is where William needed to accept that this is what Harry wanted. That's what his heart was. And that's where his heart was, and he should have accepted Megan into the fold. Personally, I'm the type that says, okay, prove me wrong. I don't have to go out of my way to be petty and aggressive. If I felt strongly about someone, I would let them do their thing and wait to get my proof that they sucked. Of course, folks can prove you wrong like all the time. In that case, you have to be man or woman enough to know that your supposed gut instinct failed. And if you acted a fool, you need to apologize. Or if you were quietly hating, you just need to fix your face and your heart. For William, he needs to realize that these are two grown adults who have lived full lives, who are emotionally mature and intelligent, who have a sense of what they want in life, and made their choice to lovingly unite and be a family in every sense of the word. It's obvious that this Mountbatten-Windsor family lacks the grandmother, you know, the big mama, the Italian or Jewish or whatever ethnicity of a hearty mama soul. You know what I mean, the no-filter matriarch who will spit some facts and real talk to these brothers, and by the time they emerge, the is handled. Some ears might be red from the blasting, but all would be well. Now, Betty's able to do it, but she won't because she's too busy letting the queen personality sit in the driver's seat instead of moving so that the grandmother can get into the position, into the driver position. And I don't think that Charles is unable to do it either. I simply think that his relationship isn't tight enough with his sons 
to interject himself into matters of the heart. Like, he seriously burned that bridge with his conscious coupling with Camilla. Harry did say that Meghan has helped his relationship with his father to improve. But in my mind, Charles ain't trying to get his head handed to him by a hot-tempered gingerhead. Maybe someone can rent a Tyler Perry's Medea-type person to come in and broker a peace treaty. Because it is just so stupid to be at odds. Diana's mother regretted falling out with her daughter all the way up to the time of her death. William and Harry regretted not having that full conversation with their mother on the day of her death. I'm not saying that death should be the only reason to do something, but I'm emphasizing how much time we, we as a people, as a society, we waste when we're feuding with family and conflicts always come down to ego. So William wants Harry at his side. Well, get over it, William. You all manipulated Harry's life to force him to choose between depression and a breath of fresh air. That's what it boiled down to. Staying in the monkey house at the zoo to become a favorite attraction or walking with shoulders back, head up, chest out to live and breathe and grow into a productive person. Just look at what Harry has managed to do since announcing his departure from the Senior Royal Roadshow. We're getting a taste of what his influence and power will be. And the dimwits and the firm could have partnered with Harry to modernize the monarchy. Give it a facelift. Even elevate William. Remember I said that I wasn't trying to shellac an ass to an icon. Well, William would fit that bill. If he chose to work with Harry, he could come out looking all spiffy and, and hip. Now, people want to see Diana's son be king. And that's expected. There's an emotional bond. And maybe that's why some are so butthurt that Harry isn't riding William's coattails. But the two could and maybe still can be a dynamic duo as partners. Don't mistake my sentiment as giving a hoot about William or his kingship. I don't care. Not even a little. I'm coming at this from how we in the normal world would be expected to behave by reasonable elders in our families. Anyway, on to brighter stuff. Harry got his lady. And for those only getting to know Megan once she became Harry's official girlfriend, it might have been easy to fall into the media trap that Megan had no real substance prior to the announcement. I'll skip mention of the ridiculous nonsense said about her. We know that she had loyal fans, fame, and her own fortune, none of which she would have earned without a work ethic, intelligence, and self-awareness. In hindsight, with the way the departure played out and their move to Canada and then California, we can really celebrate how freaking awesome these two are together. You can see them put their heads together as Harry shared his vision to be free of his royal life and to raise their ch child or children outside the gilded cage. And with Megan's worker bee mentality and savviness, along with channeling some Doria vibes, they executed a history-making, groundbreaking initiative that the media just can't stop talking about, even with all their lies and mud-raking. I mean, Harry and Meghan did this. They split their office from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, in addition to breaking from the Royal Foundation. They launched legal action against the Mail on Sunday over a claim that it unlawfully published one of Meghan's letters. Harry talked about the double standards of the press pack that had vilified his wife almost daily during her pregnancy. And, as another part of breaking barriers, he got to go through the process of buying a house, which must have felt so good something that is theirs and not a hand-me-down. They launched their 
anchor to settle and raise Archie in a place where they both wanted to live. Yes, Harry wants to live in California. Of course he misses his family. He's not dead inside. But that doesn't mean he misses that roadshow and is pining for a return to that life. So stop that nonsense. So what's to come next? Well, Act 3 is not done. It's unfurling with so much possibility that I look forward to Harry and Meghan breaking more barriers with his Netflix domination. Surveying whether the Brits would watch or support the show is a stupid exercise by the media. If the couple use British actors or British production crews, it's money for the British people. It would be stupid to act like they wouldn't take the job or wouldn't support it. But that's how shallow the paid and unpaid trolls are in thinking they can control the narrative of Harry's legacy, in thinking that they can undo his accomplishments. So here I am. I'm going to wish them both light and love. As we know with our hero stories, there's always an obstacle up ahead to be conquered on the road to victory. So onward and upward, Prince Harry, and a very happy birthday to you. Peace and light, Duchess of Sussex. This is Mish Monk, signing out.